Shakti Shekharan from IMAI. I welcome you all once again to the panel discussion on digital solutions to address financial frauds and market abuse. We would like to begin by thanking you all for being a part of Pursue 2021, combating financial frauds with technology supported by Invest India and Startup India. We would like to thank you, or rather our partners, session partner, Refinitive, Gold partner, Rakita, Bronze partner, Onfito, and Knowledge partner, ENY. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Sarabjit Singh, partner KPMG, who will be moderating today's discussion. Over to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, I, uh, and, and, and good evening and good afternoon and uh, good morning, uh, you know, based on uh, where you are logging in from. And uh, I got a fantastic panel with me. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, the panel to you. Uh, I got with me uh, Sujata Dasgupta, who is the Global Head of Financial Crime Compliance at TCS, uh, and driving uh, regulatory and digital transformation, solution development, looking at sales, uh, pre-sales alliances and client programs. Uh, she has uh, over two decades of experience in uh, financial crime uh, and uh, anti-bribery uh, sort of uh, programs uh, across uh, major financial hubs, uh, New York, London, Singapore, Frankfurt, uh, and then many more, uh, including uh, India, obviously, and the Nordics. Uh, she's currently based out of uh, Sweden. And, uh, you know, uh, she's been the winner of the Risk Professional of the Year in the Women's yeah. Technology and Data Awards, as well as, uh, you know, a Fraud Prevention Award uh, in the Anti-Financial Crimes Awards 2021 from Temis as well. She's worked with uh, IBM and SBI as well. And, uh, you know, welcome, uh, welcome, Sujata. Thank you so much, Sarabhi. Uh I also got uh, Ajay, uh, Ajit Hati, uh, who is the founder Thanks. and uh, director of Pure ID. Um, he's a inventor, innovator, and, uh, you know, he's been developing enterprise class security products for over a decade and a half. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Null Open Security Community and the founder of Blockchain Village. Uh, which he organizes at DEF CON every year. Um, he's worked with Citrix, uh, Symantec, Emerson, IBM over his career as well. Uh, welcome, Ajit. Yeah, thanks, Arabji. Thanks a lot. Uh, we got uh, Yashwant Loda, from, uh, who's, who's the founder of uh, Pay Nearby. Uh, Pay Nearby is a fintech company that seeks to create the largest branchless banking network. Uh, that's that's a sort of a, a big ask and... Uh, uh, you know, we were discussing uh, very much on the way uh, to do that. Uh, it operates a B2B to C model, partnering with uh, neighborhood retail stores and enabling them to and providing them tools for financial and digital commerce. Uh, they cover over 17,000 PIN codes in India and, uh, you know, especially in uh, tier two uh, and tier three towns in rural India. And uh, to that extent, uh, you know, and then uh, Yashwant has worked with Yes Bank and Tally Solutions earlier in his career as well. Welcome, Yashwant. Thank you. Uh, Martin is a director uh, of Source Code Control <laughs> Limited. And, uh, you know, over 20 years, uh, you know, he's been providing organization with strategies to manage business risks associated with open source software, supply chains, uh, IP compliance, security, vulnerability assess uh, management and procurement. Uh, he's actively involved in the open source software uh, management industry and is the founder of uh, the Open Chain uh, Partner uh, uh, as well. Uh, Martin's worked with organizations such as Microsoft, Global Cyber Consultants, Snow Software as well. Welcome, Martin. So it's it's uh, really sort of uh, you know interesting in terms of uh, you know the topic and it is very uh, you know with the pandemic and the chaos. That has uh, so also been uh, sort of and sort of uh, come about on account of uh, the opportunities that it has uh, provided to fraudsters. Uh, there is a significant amount of ups, I mean, uh, uptick in the whole uh, you know fraud uh, activity of uh, you know of, of people. I mean, uh, and and given that people have moved on to the digital space uh, like never before. I mean. We have seen companies with, which have been thinking about implementing solutions uh, for uh, years together. And, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic has been uh, a catalyst and sort of uh, they have been 
sort of uh, changed systems altogether uh, in a very, very short time. So, so people have gone digital uh, like never before, uh, which also sort of opens uh, up uh, and then provides new opportunities to, to fraudsters. And, uh, you know, and then in that particular uh, context, just wanted to uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, move to uh, Sujata to just, uh, you know, articulate in terms of what are some of the challenges that you are seeing and, you know, what are the, some of the uh, issues that you see in the industry at this point of time? Thank you, Sarabjit. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank IMAI for, for organizing this wonderful conference and having all of us here to uh, have a focused discussion on this very topic. And that's very close to my heart as well. Uh, Taking a cue from what Sarabjit just mentioned, that COVID itself has, uh, you know, on, on the one thing, the good thing has been uh, acceleration of digitization, which has been good for the customers, the economy, for, you know, the entire ecosystem across all industries, whether, the, whether it's retail or uh, education or, uh, you know, entertainment, uh, commerce, finance, everything. On the other hand, this has given uh, the scope to criminals to uh, you know, mastermind a lot more kinds of fraud. So the type of fraud itself that is perpetrated during this this uh, just one and a half years has been enormous. Uh, so this definitely is, you know, is one of the challenges that uh, with technology, as technology grows, as the uh, as customers are given more option for for payments, as the kind of products, the kind of channels they uh, uh, they are uh, increased. As as all these progress happens. The kind of frauds that we witness in the industry is also, uh, you know, increasing in terms of uh, volumes, in terms, in terms of sophistication, in terms of variety, the complexity. So that is definitely a challenge which which we are seeing in the ecosystem right now. So uh, banks, being banks and other financial institutions, of course, they are they being at the forefront. They are, uh, you know, the first line of defense, as we call them. So for them, what are the institutional challenges uh, that we see? So most large organizations, uh, uh, you know. The, the larger banks uh, that we see uh, globally have been there for more than 150, 200 years. And they they have grown organically, right? So by mergers, acquisitions, adding on new platforms. So, so, so all this has created a, a, a very disparate system. So uh, if I have to talk about the top, top three areas, for example, I would talk about first would be the data challenge. Data is so fragmented in any organization, any financial financial institution that we look at. So you will not have a single single source. Even customer data would be fragmented. Uh, if we look at the channels, the product channels. So uh, for cars, there would be a different system. For uh, your online banking, there would be a different system. For ATMs, there would be a different system. So all these data doesn't come and sit in one common uh, you know common pool. So the data is extremely fragmented, and that makes it difficult for uh, for any detection system to to look at a holistic uh, scenario or a behavior variance, you know, deviation to a customer's behavior, that becomes a problem. So data is definitely one of the very big challenges. Second technology, as I was mentioning, technology is, you know, it, we're still running a, a lot on the legacy systems, that which was acquired a few years ago or something which has been, you know, built on top of the other. But we know the need of the R is, uh, you know, a, a complete transformation. So that is taking shape, but still, uh, what is in action is more of, uh, you know, the rule based legacy systems on top of which we are trying to do some kind of analytics or machine learning based. So we are, we are trying to improvise on this, but the base detection system still remains uh, the, the legacy ones. So technology, again, is, is one of the challenges, but it's changing. The third, I would say, is uh, a lot of these processes that we see in, in uh, you know, in terms of defending against uh, frauds and financial crimes. A lot of these functions are uh, manual. For example, uh, if we look at the KYC onboarding process, a lot of that part is manual. If we look at the alert detection investigation, uh, not the detection, the investigation part, a lot of that is manual. So uh, manual activity, of course, uh, you know, is, is not something which is going to see us through the next decade because there, there are so many sources of data. There are so many uh, systems that one looks at. So all this cannot be done manually effectively is what I mean to say. So uh, I think uh, this is also one of the challenges uh, I would say. So the top three in my mind would be these, uh, the data challenges, the technology challenges and the process challenges, because processes are mostly manual and they, they need to move towards a more, you know, automated exception based flow. So everything would be automated only when there is an exception, it should come to a, a manual. That is where, you know, your, uh, the data, the universe of data that we have, the various sources of data that we have, it, it, there's, there's abundant data in the, in the you know, ecosystem right now. If all that has to be combined and analyzed, it cannot be a manual driven process. 
So it, it has to go through this uh, automated straight through process exception. -based. So I think those would be my top three. You're on mute, Sarabjit, I think. Sorry. Uh, when, when you talk about data, and that's that's something uh, pretty, pretty pretty close to you know uh, what I work on as well uh, at, at a global scale, and uh, you know on on one hand we have a situation where there's been a data explosion, you know if if we today I mean with the whole digital journey of that businesses have undertaken, and the fact that uh, payments. Uh, uh, with with the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, have gone online, contactless, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, person not uh, card not present transactions, for example, have gone about 10 times higher than, you know, uh, card present uh, transactions. So all those uh, situations are also coming in and uh, uh, where on one hand, with, there is a lot of data that is there. But on the other hand, that, that is also providing opportunities to uh, fraudsters. Uh, because they can mix some of the uh, data coming in from data breaches, which are also uh, more common now as compared to what it was earlier. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, creating these synthetic, uh, you know, identities and then uh, taking that forward. So so a couple of questions uh, that, that come in and I'll sort of, uh, you know, put it for the panel and maybe uh, Yashwant, you can sort of uh, go first on that. I mean, what I had in mind was uh, with these synthetic identities, uh, you know, and then given, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, a large network that you manage, uh, uh, you know, and from a branchless banking point of view, uh, you know, how does one sort of look at this risk and, uh, you know, how does, uh, one manage this particular risk uh, with uh, you know uh, some of the so-called retail partners, whether they are there or not, whether they exist or not uh, at that location, uh, you know, and then what technologies do you use as part of the business uh, uh, verification process, for example, uh, you know that that uh, might be uh, sort of relevant if you can just take that. Right. So. Uh... So, sir, we, uh, so while Sujata covered, and maybe I'll take two steps back from the question that you answered, and probably then you know lead into the into the question, right? So while Sujata, for example, covered a lot on what the institutions are facing as a challenge, right? Due to which frauds happen. Probably I want to. I will take the other side of the coin, and 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 you know give you some example and some prime reasons that in my mind are the reasons for frauds that happen in the consumer angle, right? Right. While while one is you know, legacy technology, disparate data, etc. Uh, a lot of it is also because overall in the last few years, things have changed very, very fast, right? Uh, things that used to change, take 20 years for change, took 10 years and now have taken 10 months and even 10 weeks in the pandemic, right? Yeah. Literally companies started new businesses in two months, right? Businesses in two months, right? Uh, at a, for consumers at a mass scale, right? Leave out the top two percent highly educated, highly you know highly aware customers, right? For consumers at a mass scale, adopting to such change at speed becomes very difficult, and hence, therefore, they are you know open to uh, being uh, becoming you know fraud uh, you know being part of fraud transactions, right? Uh, it comes stems from a lot of things, uh, lack of general education uh, or lack of digital education at times. For example, uh, you know, my, my will not use a net banking transaction. Not he does not know how to use a net banking transaction. Forget will not right. So so people like them are susceptible to trans uh, you know frauds by. The, when somebody calls and says, uh, hello, I am speaking from ICICI bank, your uh, uh, PAN number is so-and-so and so-and-so, et cetera, your account is going to be blocked or, uh, you know, you have a credit which needs to be extended, please share an OTP, right? Uh, those, those, those things happen because of it. Another challenge is a lot of uh, experience design, whether it be the experience of the process or experience of the system, the user interface itself. It is done with a assumption of knowledge of the user, uh, uh, primarily because uh, the designs or the design philosophy or the technology philosophy that have been applied to high-end users, right? Again, the top five percent early adopters, etc., 
is almost being ported to the rest of the rest of the user base which is not a very uh, which is not a great idea so usse kya hota hai so what happens because of that is these people again they see stuff that they don't understand and hence seek and and, and have a need for assistance and again people cap, uh, fraudsters capitalize on this need for assistance from people right if sarajit if you could do a transaction yourself fully the chance of you committing a fraud is much or you big being you know being being part of fraud is much much lesser as compared to let's say me a malafied character advising you in some manner right don't do this do that right that that also leads to a uh, lot of right so uh, so the the key thing that is how do we make people uh, aware and and reduce the need for uh, assistance all the time right so for example like you were mentioning in in, in our retail network right uh, one of the major challenge like you mentioned was identification and continued identity who retailer is that retailer there is is the person who there okay today sarabjit was there doing a transaction is tomorrow same sarabjit doing a transaction or not right so in in terms of verification what we do while onboarding and uh, ongoing verification right till now a lot of kyc was onboarding a lot of the kyc and processes have to now become ongoing right uh, today i may have good intent tomorrow i may be influenced by someone else to start committing fraud right because i found out that somebody else did fraud and made money so probably i can also do it uh, right so these are the intents that need to be followed a lot of this uh, so some of the frauds that have been enabled by technology it is also the technology that is the uh, enabler for uh, eliminating or uh, reducing those frauds right so for example stuff like geofencing a retailer who was onboarded at uh, area a should continue to do a business in area a retailers who are moving retailers now of course there are exceptions right there are uh, there are banking agents who you know go to village a on monday village b on tuesday village c on wednesday right but those are exceptions not the norm so like uh, sujata was mentioning a few minutes ago right technology should handle this straight through processes while the exceptions go to the manual queue it similarly so such people who are moving about uh, need to be handled uh, a authentication mechanism just because sarabjit uh, or or yashwant getting onboarded on the by network gave certain documents or information about himself two years ago uh, needs to be validated on a daily basis so for example stuff like uh, face id method matching right we don't uh, so when we take an onboarding of the retailer we take a selfie every day every time he logs in it has to be the same photo right and with vision recognition technology image recognition technology becoming so you know so advanced uh, things have been enabled very easily uh, you know uh, any person who's doing significantly you know ano anomalous transactions right uh, we have set up a video calling interface right in the app itself we call the retailer the retailer picks up we can see okay is he in that store is that store showing that he is a banking agent has his video has his store changed significantly from where he was whereas the data has not changed right if if somebody has changed the store address his system should also reflect those changes so a lot of these uh, changes have to be uh, uh, done from a technology uh, driven driven by technology and uh, analyzing the data that is available thankfully we are a younger organization so unlike a lot of legacy organization we don't have the uh, the burden of uh, managing a huge legacy data which we have to uh, organize thankfully we started building our organization and technology in a manner that data did not become scattered yes we have our own set of problems i'm not saying that everything is anti dory but it is far far lesser uh, synthetic identities so so there will always be challenges i am not saying that we are a fraud proof organization but we try to minimize fraud by using so a retailer a, a customer cannot do transactions at two retailers which are 50 kilometers apart in one hour logic makes sense right 
So those transactions are to be blocked real time. This is uh, how we generally prevent uh, synthetic uh, frauds. However, uh, there are there are scenarios where people uh, slip through the net. Uh, we use them as learning opportunities, right? While making sure that the customer is not out of funds. That's that's the broad theme. Right. I hope I was able to cover the questions that you wanted. To yep, ask. yep, yep. No, I think uh, that is there, and uh, you know, uh, also uh, you know, with the whole uh, explosion of the payment space, uh, you know, with OTT platforms coming in, groceries, payments, uh, food, and transport. You know, you have apps for everything. Everyone has payment information, and uh, everyone, uh, uh, you know, uh, every one of those apps and businesses have your data. Plus, at the same time. Uh, there is uh, opportunities uh, to sort of uh, commit fraud, uh, you know, on those uh, applications as well. So uh, from from that perspective, uh, you know, and I wanted to bring you in over here, uh, Jeet, in terms of, you know, how does, for example, uh, you know, a pure ID, uh, which is the organization you run, how does that kind of, uh, does it come in any, any anywhere in terms of trying to be able to uh, of help uh, you know, for these particular applications and, uh, you know, across the board, or is it only for enterprises as a whole that, uh, you know, the, the solution uh, sort of uh, you develop uh, comes in? So, as far as uh, uh, financial frauds, etc. are concerned, uh, we uh, address that problem in two different ways. So, one is the offline. Uh, that is in physical world where the frauds etc take place and another is online where uh, uh, you have talked about synthetic identities etc so what we think is uh, identity model is uh, uh, pretty vulnerable people can steal identity people can replay others identity right uh, or uh, identity can be forged etc so that's the reason uh, we developed a platform where uh, we uh, verify people uh, based on their association and not their absolute identities, right? So uh, when we do this, when we verify a person with the association, like Sarabjit is associated with KPMG, and if we have something signed by KPMG, which we can verify anytime, okay, uh, uh, then then it will be much much easier to verify the right person. Like uh, Yashwan said, that their agents they go to people, right? And it's not only uh, uh, with uh, his uh, pay nearby model, uh, but usually what happens at rural places, uh, someone goes and talks to the people in village saying that I am from a bank or I am a government officer uh, who can help you to fix up your Aadhaar problems, etc. So give me your data or uh, give me access to uh, your Aadhaar or give me your Aadhaar number, put your finger here and I will sort the things for you, right? So there are people, they just, literally trust that person. They, even if they want to cross verify whether this person is from bank or pay nearby, they don't have any means to do that, right? So we have developed platform uh, where you can uh, verify a person by his association, whether he is truly associated with a person, uh, uh, with, with, with an organization or not. So yes, our solution is for enterprises, but it is to prove uh, their affiliates or their people or their employees, uh, their, their association with the company. Okay. And we use the same authentic, uh, association based uh, verification or authentication model to give uh, uh, secure uh, or passwordless authentication to enterprise resources. Right. Okay. And then over here, um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is also the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, new challenges being thrown up, new sort of use cases coming up uh, and being utilized by fraudsters uh, companies and organizations need to also respond uh, quickly uh, there has to be a certain speed with which tech has to be enabled to be basically uh, respond to some of these uh, crises and uh, i wanted to bring in uh, you know martin over here from you know given the fact that uh, the speed of uh, tech changes that involves upgrades upgrade updates uh, introduction of new technologies, uh, you know, what are the some of the risks that come with that, um, especially from a code fraud perspective? And you know, how big is the problem? And uh, you know, uh, just in terms of uh, from a source code perspective, with which on you know on which you're uh, 
uh, sort of uh, expert. So maybe you could throw some light on that, Martin. Thank you. Um, so all this talk of digitization, you know, this acceleration, particularly with COVID, of uh, banks and financial institutions moving to the cloud, all underpinning that is software. And a lot of people are unaware that modern software development, uh, developers will use code off the internet. So there are multiple code sharing sites where literally developers will copy and paste code, and merge it with their own code to build a solution. Now the challenge is, and this is where it becomes a potential threat, is some, some of that code will have known security vulnerabilities. And unless you have a method for checking you know, versions of components and libraries that developers use, inadvertently, software development companies are putting vulnerable code into solutions which are delivered to customers. And those vulnerabilities can be exploited once they're delivered. So inadvertently, you can enable fraud by providing a solution with known vulnerabilities. Now, recently, um, has been what's referred to as supply chain attacks. And this is where bad actors, so hackers, are actually seeding some of these code sharing sites with components with malware. So the malware comes into the code base, which then delivers into a solution, whether it's a mobile app or a cloud solution, or even embedded software in an ATM. And so the hackers, the bad actors, know that code's going into applications, they can start searching for applications with that malware in, and they exploit it. And that's exactly what happened with SolarWinds and recently Kaseya. The challenge is most software development companies don't have a strategy for tracking components for vulnerabilities. Now, what is happening uh, globally, particularly in the US, and in Europe is because of this situation, there is an increase in regulation forcing companies acquiring software, companies developing software to actually address that situation. So in the, in the finance sector, I'll just give you a couple of examples. The payment card industry, so PCI compliance, uh, so organizations who take credit card transactions have to be conformant with PCI. A lot of people will be aware of that. What they won't be aware of is there's a recent standard uh, introduced by PCI for software companies developing solutions that have to be PCI compliant. So it's called a, a secure software development framework. And in our framework explicitly states, software companies need to be able to identify third party code that developers have used to build a solution. If it's vulnerable and a strategy for remediating those vulnerabilities, therefore protecting uh, the institutions using that software. Uh, recently in the US, the White House issued what's called an executive order, which is guidance for US companies. And the, the executive order in May was about improving the nation's cybersecurity. That's quite a lengthy document, but in that document, from a software perspective, uh, it stated every software solution delivered to a customer should include a list of third party code. It's referred to as a software bill of materials. You can think of it sort of as an inventory of all the makeup of the software, or you could think of it like the ingredients list on food packaging. And then so, say for instance, a financial institution outsources some development for one of these new digital solutions. They should receive one of these ingredients lists of all the components, libraries, version numbers, and if there's no vulnerabilities, which enables them to manage the security aspect of that. If you don't do that, obviously you are potentially enabling fraud by delivering a solution with vulnerabilities. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then I think, uh, uh, you know, so, so is there a standard which is there uh, globally right. that's acceptable right. uh, for something like well, that? Well, yeah, so, so, so following on from all this guidance, there's, there's also coming to market standards. So uh, the Linux Foundation founded a project called OpenChain, which is supported by a lot of the big software companies and smaller software companies. So Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Uber, uh, all the big car manufacturers who you know, develop software. 
has, has become an ISO standard. It's ISO 5230 open chain standard. And the chain refers to supply chain. And it's, it's if, if you develop software, have you got a rigorous process for tracking what third party code is in your code? And are you addressing all those challenges I, I talked about? Now, what we are seeing is companies acquiring software solutions. And you know, a lot of the software developed for financial institutions are outsourced to third parties. But what we are seeing is requirements coming in saying, we can only accept software if it's conformance with that standard. And also there should be a software bill of materials accompanying the code, which enables us to understand the makeup of the code, thereby enable us to you know, track for issues like security vulnerabilities. Um, so it's it's an industry, the, the software development industry is maturing, if you like, to address that challenge. Right, no, I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, this was definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, one of the things that gets added to, uh, you know, from if I look at it from a, a anti-fraud and a anti uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, from a financial crime perspective, uh, you know, this component definitely gets added to the list of uh, things that, uh, you know, one as a compliance uh, personnel, one needs to be bothered about, one needs to have knowledge about. So it's, it's sort of really expanding. Uh, do, 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 that. So, do, do, the, do, the, do the things to be aware of. If, if, if you're a financial institution and say so you, you are exploited by a hacker or a fraudster and you investigate the issue and you you find it was the hackers breached whatever application via a say an open source component with a known vulnerability and if you've been tracking it you could have avoided it it's an avoidable risk therefore your legal uh, issues are, are actually bigger because it was an avoidable risk in 2017 equifax which is a credit checking agency in the us well, actually globally they, they, they lost all their data to a hacker. And the way the hackers got into their customer portal was through two vulnerabilities in an open source framework. Uh, and the thing is, there was later versions of that framework which weren't vulnerable, but they didn't even know they were using that framework in their code. So the point is it was an avoidable risk and that, that, that hack cost them over $4 billion and impacted the US economy. And it was just caused by a hundred lines of code, literally. Yeah. Right. No, I think uh, that's what, I mean, uh, you know, organizations need to kind of uh, respond to some of these challenges and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, obviously new technologies are uh, put at play. I mean, uh, Yashwant, you talked about, uh, you know, in terms of image recognition, uh, uh, you know, that definitely is there, uh, you know, when I look at it, from a bank's uh, financial institution's perspective, um, a lot of them are sort of looking at it. In fact, even uh, you know, from a financial fraud perspective, uh, you have uh, a lot of FMCG companies, uh, you know, where uh, they are spending uh, huge amounts, giving uh, you know incentives and you know uh, you know marketing costs uh, for uh, for their uh, retailers on the ground and for their distributors on the ground. And you have pictures, uh, you know, of uh, things that have been put together for marketing purposes, and that same image getting utilized multiple in multiple places by multiple, uh, you know, uh, uh, so-called, uh, you know, distributors, and uh, you know, finding fraud over there. So, so there is that whole component where you know, uh, ML and AI is getting utilized uh, in in some of the deduction uh, deduction of uh, you know financial fraud, but. I mean, across the panel, maybe what we could do is, uh, you know, just in terms of, you know, what are the certain use cases that you are coming across where ML and AI is getting specifically utilized for, uh, you know, use cases. I mean, all these are going to add up over a period of time, but right now it's small use cases that uh, one is uh, developing these aspects for. So, you know, uh, you know, it will be great if uh, you can share some of the examples that uh, you may be working on or you're aware of, or you're using um, as as part of what you do. Sure, I can I can uh, you know start with a, a few examples. 
so uh, as we know that uh, uh, the uh, when we look at a fraud or a financial crimes the whole defense it's broken down into a uh, 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 you know a life cycle right we talk about prevention detection investigation and the reporting part so in each of these there are uh, they work in a combination. So there are technologies, there are manual processes. It's it's a combination along the way. But uh, earlier, like I was mentioning, a lot of these processes are manual. And even where there is technology, technology tends to be uh, more of, you know, the rule based uh, traditional ones, which are not capable of coping with the, you know, the, the level of digitization and the sophistication that we are seeing now in terms of uh, frauds. So uh, if I have to take some use case in terms of uh, prevention, so prevention, uh, we generally talk about uh, the KYC, which uh, Yashwant was also, uh, you know, talking about, moving from a contact based to a contactless. So uh, earlier, the onboarding that we were seeing, onboarding as well as uh, you know the regular due diligence, the reviews, the refresh. What we used to see was it was more of uh, uh, you know contact based, where a customer would come and uh, provide his documents, and then uh, there would be a face to face interaction. Again, when there is a review required, there would be a mail going out, some sort of a customer outreach. So that was more of a contact based process. Now it is moving towards more uh, you know automated. That is the digital ID and V process, as we call it, the identification and verification process, where uh, you know all this is done digitally. So there would be this app. The customer would uh, would be able to do a you know, selfie based uh, uh, video of uh, himself, herself, uh, scan all the documents through that uh, through that IDV application. Uh, there would be, you know, the, all the technology that uh, Yashwant was also mentioning about uh, the OCR and the image recognition and, uh, you know, the authentication mechanisms, whether the documents are, uh, you know, genuine or they have been tampered. So all that forensic scans would run through matching of the image on the document with the selfie of the person. Matching the documents with with the actual database. So if it's a Indian passport that I have provided, there should be a check with the Indian passport database. So if it's a social security number in US, it should be you know corresponding one. So all these kind of checks are being done by this uh, solution, uh, uh, you know the IDB solution. If everything goes through perfectly, then it would go to the next step, right? So it would it would then go through the screening and uh, risk scoring and all of that. If everything goes through, it would just go for the final authorization. If something is not right, if something is not matching, it would then fall into the exception queue for an analyst to then pick up. So this is uh, you know sort of uh, automation where the system itself does a lot of work. Whereas if if these if there is a you know forged document for a human analyst, it may not be that easy to identify that this document is forged. Whereas now you have technology which is uh, which is doing that. So I think this is one use case which we are seeing a lot of banks are adopting, uh, where they are uh, enabling uh, digital ID and V. So this not only works for onboarding, it works every time that the customer wants to update his data because earlier you know we we also don't go to the bank every time if we have changed an address or uh, you know if our uh, employment has changed we don't go to the to the bank and do it if there is an app it is easy for for the uh, you know the customer also to do it through that uh, um, uh, digital application so this is something digital id and v is something which i've uh, seen it's it's being adopted a lot in in the prevention uh, space also, there is, uh, you know, there is one more important uh, regulatory uh, aspect also that is uh, adverse media screening. And uh, we know the, the amount of work that goes into an adverse media screening that most banks that I know are not doing it at all. Right? Like, uh, uh, I'm not taking names, but we do know that this is not being done at all. The maximum that any bank is doing is doing a, you know, just a public domain search. And we also know how effective a public domain search is. I mean, you just put any of our names there and there would be like, uh, you know, 10 pages of records. So how do you know which which is the actual me and which of them mentions me in a negative context? So it's not possible uh, manually. So so what banks were doing is they were just doing a, a, a you know, as they call it, Google search on on the uh, on the day that a customer is being onboarded. For individuals, it's still okay. Imagine for corporates. So uh, this was not being done at all. But now with uh, you know NLP based and AI based contextual matching, there is uh, th there are a lot of tools now in the system uh, in the in the uh, you know in the industry where um, adverse media screening is also being enabled by AI, machine learning, NLP, uh, contextual matching. So what happens is. Uh, through these thousand pages of, of records that uh, that the system identifies, it will identify the exact match, which which is the real me, 
And then from those, if they trim it down to say 100 uh, news entries out of those, which actually mentions me in a negative context. So I may be mentioned about, you know, like winning an award or I would have written an article or I would have been, uh, you know, part of somebody who's giving a comment rather than somebody who has perpetrated a crime itself. So all these things are also being enabled by, uh, you know, this, the sentiment analysis, contextual matching. All of these technologies are enabling uh, uh, automated adverse media screening as well. So this is also a part of your, um, you know, the, you can call it the detection or the prevention uh, mechanisms. Now, in terms of detection, uh, there is a huge challenge with false positive alerts. Like, again, that that is uh, uh, that is due to several reasons uh, being data challenges uh, and, and the detection mechanism itself being one of the reasons. So now we are seeing a lot of optimization of false alerts, which is also being enabled by uh, machine learning and other forms of AI. Even advanced analytics are being used. So optimization of alerts means that uh, uh, you know, even if you are using a rule-based system, the rule-based system would generate a lot of false alerts. So how do you uh, minimize the effort of your analysts in investigating all of these? And then out of 100 alerts, you come up with 95 as false alerts, but your effort is wasted, right, for investigating all those. So optimization of false alerts is where uh, even if it is a rule-based system which has generated all these alerts, there would be these AI and machine learning algorithms, which would then uh, uh, analyze all of these uh, alerts and either, uh, you know, depending on what the bank wants, either hibernate them or auto close them, uh, the alerts which are identified as false. So what happens is if 95 out of 95 uh, false, 95% uh, false alerts, most machine learning algorithms are now able to discount or, or you know, close at least 30 to 40% of false alerts. So at least that much of effort is reduced. So that is something which uh, uh, you know which is happening in uh, in the optimization space, and then of course there is uh, there is this uh, you know very new concept of network analytics, where uh, we know that crimes are not in, committed by individuals; they are committed by you know an organized rings, but uh, it it may not be possible to identify because the transactions that a customer in my bank is doing. It may look all genuine because I do not know, uh, you know, the rest of his transaction. What is uh, how he's connected with others? He may be connected to some criminal link, but from my banking trans transactions, I'm not able to find it. So now uh, there is this new graph technology, which is enabling uh, uh, integration of the bank's internal data with external data from other reference data sources. For example, your Dun and Bradstreet or Dow Jones or you know Bureau Van Dyke. So you integrate both of these sets of data. And then the bank is able to find out through these network analytics, uh, the, you know, the solutions. Your customer may actually be linked to some entities or organizations or corporates, uh, you know, either uh, very closely or distantly, but they might be connected. So these uh, network analytics solutions, they are very interesting actually. So they will give you in a, you know, a graphical format, like uh, you, you can uh, actually uh, blow up one of these nodes and see how they are connected, who is connected to whom, how they are connected. So, so there is the concept of nodes and edges. So nodes are actually the en entities or individuals or addresses, and the edges are actually the relationships. So whether they are closely connected, also how many levels close or away you are from, from that you know, close criminal link. So, so that gives a risk of my customer also. So I think these are all very uh, you know, interesting developments that we are seeing uh, where AI, um, uh, machine learning, other forms of AI also, they could be you know, like the graph analytics that I mentioned. These are all enabling a lot more intensity in terms of uh, investigation, prevention, detection, all of these. Right. So I think uh, you know, uh, what, what you mentioned, I mean, I've, I've similarly sort of seen that. And in fact, uh, for uh, sanction subjects, for example, we actually uh, implemented for one of the larger banks uh, a system uh, which is uh, identifying, uh, you know, uh, uh, sanctioned subjects up to a 99% uh, accuracy in terms of the whole uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, throughput that was there. So to that extent, uh, that was fairly uh, significant in terms of a breakthrough that and then plus the regulator uh, looked at it and was satisfied with it. So So that went through as well. I think the other uh, use case that uh, you know I worked on. Uh, so there's uh, you you have politically exposed persons, PEPs, obviously coming in, and uh, uh, so you know some of the databases that you mentioned, uh, uh, you know uh, you know the you know refinitives and uh, uh, you know you have uh, you know BVD and Moody's and uh, you know uh, DNB on all these databases. Uh, we actually create a lot of data for some of these 
organizations. So, uh, you know, uh, doing the network analysis is when the data is structured and put together in that database. Yes. But yes. Uh, take a step back. It's that whole cleaning up exercise of Creation. actually identifying, um, you know, uh, what that data should look like and, yes. you know, ensuring that all of it is matching up because if it's going in finally into the database as a as a gold record, uh, yeah. it has to be at that standard as well. That's and uh, so, so to that extent, there's a significant amount of uh, NLP as well as contextualization that is coming to make some of these records, uh, you know, and, and I've been doing that for a while uh, for uh, some of the, uh, you know, large uh, sort of uh, providers and uh, uh, at a global level across languages. So, uh, you know, uh, over the last 10 years, the amount of productivity has gone up something like eight times, uh, you know, from about uh, seven, 10 records to about 80 records per person. And, you know, it's a, a lot to do with the automation that has uh, come about and, and pulling the data together to be able to make that happen. So, uh, so that's definitely something where technology is really um, sort of uh, uh, having a huge uh, role to play. Uh, and then while I talk about data, uh, you know, I did want to also talk about uh, that, uh, you know, with the uh, legacy banks going digital and uh, obviously, uh, you know, some so-called uh, uh, digital challenger banks, as I would call it, where, you know, which are more uh, digital native, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the experience that they offer to customers coming in, uh, which have lesser data uh, from a point of view of verified or validated data, uh, you know, in this scenario, uh, are there any alternative data sources uh, that are there, uh, you know, to uh, that are utilized to make decisions? And you know, even I mean, uh, Ajit, you talked about associations. Are there any uh, alternative data sets that you use, uh, Yashwant, uh, you, you as well, in terms of from a risk decision making uh, perspective? Uh, what data sets are there that uh, you would be using, which are uh, not so a common or you know not the usual ones right so yashwan do you want to go first uh, and then maybe sure. i can talk about it sure so um see the, slightly so, so in, in this uh challenger bank environment and in this new bank environment right we uh, may have less so we may have less traditionally verifiable data right but i i would want to put forward a view that probably we have a lot more of other sorts of verification that is possible right uh, and 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 that enables a whole new um, whole new business line right the challenger banks the new banks or even in in this spread out environment right so from the in person transaction the person is getting removed but the transaction is getting more and more enabled right uh, alternative data sources for example right uh, a simple thing like a mobile recharge frequency of a person right, uh, will tell you whether that person is stable or not. Right? Uh, uh, whether he's changing a mobile number or not, how many times is he changing his mobile devices? Right? From data sources, I, I don't want to know. Uh, uh, probably a can also handle that, but the standard databases of voter ID card, voter ID card, right? The standard government issued services, they, they are the ones that are generally used for doing such uh, onboarding and activation of customers. But a lot of the verifications have now moved on to my and will continue to evolve as we move along from uh, trusted databases to trusted behaviors. If, if uh, a subject is behaved for some time and continues to behave in the same manner, the trust of Will be significantly higher than, let's say, a document, an unupdated Aadhaar where your address, uh, address on your Aadhaar was, let's say, you know, in, in Bombay, and now you have not updated your um, address, right? Uh, I, I uh, that your, is uh, my uh, sense of how. Sorry, go ahead. I think uh, now it's better. Yeah, that my sense of how things will evolve, right? Uh, alternate data sources, I mean, and data sources of credit bureaus and, you know, sources, I think I've already explained. Uh, my sense is that another thing that we probably are not giving enough attention to in today's conversation, but is something that will evolve over a period is the account aggregator framework that RBI has introduced, right? 
uh, enabling multiple data sources to be aggreg aggregated by an account aggregator, which can then be consumed by uh, a challenger bank or a bank or an insurer, etc., is something that is going to be a significant game changer over a period of time. Uh, I'm, I'm and, conscious and, and, of the. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, you saying something? No, uh, Yashwant, I, I was just saying I've been, uh, it's been pointed out a number of times uh, we, we kind of uh, need to wrap up, is, is what sure. I understand. So, so, and, so, so uh, I, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, over to uh, you, know, Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted, uh, Ajit, uh, you know, if you had any last comments, uh, Martin, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, sort of add to, you know, your comments uh, as we wrap up the session. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Martin. Sorry, I was just going to say, kind of a wrap up for me would be, you you can implement a secure by design strategy in software development, so avoid you know risky components and libraries coming into your code before they get into your code, and you can automate that. Cool. Uh, so, Sarabjit, uh, uh, we we operate on two principles. So, one is like no data, no sensitive data at all. We rely on the trust uh, which uh, your employer or the uh, organization you are associated with, uh, they have put on you because they have done the due diligence of checking your background, etc. So we just leverage that trust, uh, which is transformed in a cryptographic practice. Okay, and we use that uh, so that doesn't have any um, threat of being breached, etc. Plus, it doesn't need any user surveillance. Now you are talking about. Uh, gathering the behavioral data, et cetera, to verify whether this person is trustable or not. But uh, we are totally working in opposite space where we leverage the trust put by an organization on you uh, to verify you and to extend privileges or access uh, or any facilities like loan bank. If I prove that I'm working with this company as of today, okay, that should be good enough to give me the loan. You don't need to verify my behavior, my interactions, et cetera, right? My association with a, a reputed company should be good enough. Right, so we are into that model where you don't need to expose a lot of your personal data. You shouldn't be surveillanced, right? And just leveraging the trust with your association, you should be able to get through the financial transaction. So that helps everyone by number one and reducing a lot of data and the fraud risk or the breach risk, right? Uh, and second thing is, even if your associations are changing, etc., you have a provable track that you have been associated previously with this company, that company. So you don't have to do a lot of cleaning up, etc. Everything is cryptographically verified, right? So that eases a lot of things. So you don't have to uh, leverage AI ML, which are not very accurate, right? right. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Ashwant. Earlier, I think uh, I was told I had a minute, and uh, now I believe I have a couple of more minutes. Uh, you know, any anything to close and then Sujata, uh, you as well, please. Sujata, you want to go first? I think uh, I've got my chance to speak on a couple of occasions. So I think, um, you know, it, it was a great experience hearing from all of you. And um, in I think what we all have in common in this panel is that, uh, yes, we are facing a, a very complicated and uh, it's, it's getting more sophisticated, the kind of uh, frauds that we are witnessing, because it's the same technology which is enabling uh, both the customers in their uh, better customer experience, better payment journey. And it's also enabling the fraudsters because, uh, you know, there will always be some intelligent people who will be finding some some uh, kind of fraud so our our defenses have to you know have to be stronger i uh, it's it's just two days ago that i read an article that uh, uh, you know we even now have uh, synthetic voice cloning so uh, you know immediately what struck me was that uh, oh my god so now you have first we had deep fake videos so anybody could uh, you know uh, clone your video as well so the kind of idv and id and v that we are talking about so anybody could clone my video and go and open an account with my selfie so now you have uh, even uh, synthetic voice cloning. So people could use my voice and uh, use it for phone banking as well. So, uh, you know, uh, we professionals or, or the industry overall, we have to be alert all the time as to, you know, what is the new advancement in technology and think in terms of how criminals could be able to use it, right? Only then we will be able to build stronger defenses in that way. So that's that's from me. I think. Right. And, and, and I would just want to close this by saying that there are a lot of good technology companies, you know, working on uh, developing digital solutions for solving the fraud. It is, it is incumbent on the industry to take a step ahead in adopting them, right? A lot of the time it is like fraud is not big enough for me to invest, invest in, uh, uh, you know, this fraud is not big enough for me to invest in fraud prevention. 
which is which is one big problem right so that is there and overall right at a macro level <laughs> right overall at a macro level uh, we have to move kyc to consistent kyc right um, yeah and from data kyc to behavior based kyc right somebody with less data but good behavior deserves service somebody with more data but improper behavior should be banned unfortunately in a country like ours as of today at least a lot of it is data is data is god i believe it has to move toward behavior and consistency that's that's so, my conclusion right no i think uh, i agree over there ishan uh, because uh, clearly uh, perpetual kyc is definitely uh, an aspect that uh, a lot of banks are exploring and uh, Uh, I'm, I'm working with a uh, lot of them uh, in, in trying to sort of uh, put together the frameworks, uh, you know, in terms of periodicity, in terms of uh, what particular aspects uh, that need to be sort of touched based upon uh, within those uh, periods. So to that extent, that's coming through. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know that will allow a lot more uh, validation and uh, you know verification of the customers as well. but uh, you know as as uh, we as jata mentioned that so with the new technology and uh, you know with all the advancements that are happening it is also providing opportunities to the fraudsters to be able to make those uh, uh, opportunities count for them as well and uh, it's a vulnerable uh, you know and and, uh, and as you mentioned earlier on uh, you know the education that needs to happen uh, of of a particular set uh, which uh, allows uh, you know uh you know these these frauds are uh, not to happen so so clearly there are challenges uh, that are there there is new technology and i think uh uh for from my point of view i think uh, there are a lot of uh, use cases that are being uh, put together it's a question of when it will all be plugged in together which can go out as a solution and you know that will be interesting in terms of that journey over the next i think over the next 5 7 years uh you know all that is going to be clubbed and packaged and uh aggregated so you know hopefully we will be there and uh, it'll be uh, uh you know addressing some of the issues that are there over to you uh swati thank you thank you so very much mr singh and uh, thank you so much for such an engaging discussion um really uh, it was a pleasure for us uh, to have you guys on board and have the session thank you so much and stay safe thank you thank you thank you so much thank you, thank you so much for thanks sorry thanks sir ji you did a fantastic job right thank from the you. macro level where money is moving across the borders to the people uh, and to the identities and to the core so from macro to micro level you have handled the diverse panel very very well thanks Great. thank you thank, thank you so everyone thank you thank you thank you good evening